Hello and welcome tonight to a special National Keratoconus Foundation evening webinar. I am joined by Dr. Jack Parker. I'm going to give you a little bit of background information about him. Dr. Parker is the only American ever trained at the world famous Netherlands Institute of Innovative Ocular Surgery in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. He is recognized as one of the world's foremost authorities in the treatment of keratoconus and Fuchs dystrophy. He is also the author of hundreds and books and scientific articles on these and related conditions. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Parker here with us this evening. The title of his talk is International Perspective on Keratoconus Surgery. Before I let him begin, I wanted to bring your attention to the round eye logo that is on our title slide. If you don't know already, National Keratoconus Foundation supports World Keratoconus Day, which is on November 10th of every year. And we take this day to really recognize keratoconus and this condition and the impact that it has on so many eyes and lives around the world. And we wanna bring awareness and recognition to this corneal condition so that we can further improve diagnosis, treatment, and management. So now without further ado, oh, one more announcement. If you do have questions, please feel free to type them into the question box. We will have someone fielding those questions and at the last 15 minutes of this webinar, we will answer as many questions as we can. So now I am gonna turn it over to Dr. Parker. Welcome. Thank you so much, Gloria. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm excited, I'm humbled. This is the first time I've addressed this audience before and it really is a privilege and a pleasure to share a little bit of our perspective from what we have learned ourselves in the management of keratoconus. Um, I'm sure there are going to be technological flubs, and so I hope that the PowerPoint presentation is visible to everybody. I hope you can hear me, and if there's any problem, Gloria, please, I hope you'll correct me as we go along. Um, now, the topic here that I want to discuss, of course, is keratoconus, and the way I learned about this issue is basically through being around some of the greatest and smartest eye doctors in the world. It really is one of the singular fortunes of my life is to have spent time with so many smart people who've really out of the kindness of their heart taken upon them to teach me what they know. Um, really first and foremost among these people is my dad. So I'm Jack, he's John, um, and we together are the ophthalmologists at Parker Cornea. I remember when I was a kid, I just thought dad was the greatest thing in the world. And, you know, he's always been my hero and is still my best friend. And he, he really taught me more than about anybody. Beyond that, I did my training in ophthalmology abroad, internationally. That's where I did my cornea specialty work at an organization called the NEOS, the Netherlands Institute for Innovative Ocular Surgery. And the NEOS is really a very special place. They are a small organization whose singular mission is the development of new surgical techniques. You know, that's, that's pretty uncommon. Most eye doctors are trying to make a living for themselves and for their family. And they're doing a job that they love, but they are basically practitioners who are trying to see patients and maybe figure things out along the way. This place is different. The NEOS really is a primary research organization. And from that guiding philosophy, so many of the most important treatments for corneal diseases have emerged. The idea of partial corneal transplantation, transplanting the anterior instead of the whole cornea, came from the NEOS, from the founder, Dr. Garrett Mellis. This operation where you transplant the front part of the cornea, anterior lamellar keratoplasty, has in recent years been su succeeded by an operation called Bowman layer transplantation. We may talk about that a little bit here. But there have been so many innovations that have come from there, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. And really the third person who's had the most influence on me in this regard is an Indian ophthalmologist, something of a celebrity in the field of keratoconus, 
Her name is Dr. Susan Jacob, and she herself has done pioneering work in anterior lamellar transplantation, and also this brand new operation, which we will definitely talk about, called CARES, Corneal Allogenic Interostromal Ring Segment. Our practice where I work now is with my father in Birmingham, Alabama. This is him, this is dad, and this is me. And this is uh, just a random patient that we took a picture with <laughs> in the clinic that day. Uh, but actually the staff includes one other person. So my wife, Christina, and I have a now 16 month old baby girl. Her name is Iris. We thought that was basically the corniest name we could get away with. Maybe we'll call the next one Cornelia. Uh, but anyway, she also helps us in the practice, and if you come to the office, you'll see Iris kind of toddling around on most days. Um, now, our practice is recently relocated. We built a center that is dedicated to the treatment of corneal disease in Birmingham, Alabama. And this place is a little bit unique because our own philosophy at Parker Cornea is, you know, we're not Parker Vision, we're not Parker Eye, we're not Parker Ophthalmology, we're Parker Cornea. And the concept is to provide cornea specialty care to focus exclusively on complicated issues with the front part of the eye and to try to bring innovative techniques to bear that are not otherwise available in the United States, many of which have been adopted from what we have learned from our European and Indian colleagues. Now, this talk that I'm going to give is exactly the same lecture that I give visiting ophthalmologists and optometrists. When I go render a lecture in front of 50 or 100 people on the management of keratoconus, this is the talk that I give. So this is not an essentialized or reductive version of the concepts because I figure that everybody tuned into this webcam is very well informed. Pretty much everybody logged in knows the basic stuff. So we're going to dispense entirely with the basic stuff and proceed directly to the things that I am teaching other practitioners. And the first thing that I think is important to remember is that keratoconus is defined as a bilateral progressive disease. So the de dictionary definition of the entity is that it's present always in both eyes, and it's defined as a disease that gets worse over time. Now, if you wonder what is the number of people who have keratoconus, you get different answers depending on which sources you consult. There are different demographic reports, and I can never remember any of them myself. But I think one statistic that I do remember that is important is that keratoconus is common. In fact, that 10% of people who are presenting to their eye doctor seeking LASIK actually have keratoconus hmm. because the reason people want LASIK is typically because they have a high prescription. Usually it's myopia, nearsightedness, with some astigmatism. So really the way that people present to the eye doctor with complaints with keratoconus is they complain about not being able to see and being interested in refractive surgery, especially LASIK. Now, keratoconus is a type of disease called an ectasia. And acacia is a thinning and steepening disorder of the cornea. Now, there are other disorders of the cornea that cause thinning and steepening. There's a disease called pellucid marginal degeneration in which you can have thinning and steepening of the cornea. The most common other cause of corneal steepening and thinning, though, is actually iatrogenic. That means caused by doctors. And specifically, I'm talking about LASIK. LASIK is one of the most common causes of corneal ectasia, corneal steepening and thinning, because LASIK is designed to thin and reshape the recipient cornea. It involves using a laser to reshape the eye, and that can sometimes weaken the cornea such that even many years later, the cornea can start to slip. It can start to lose its shape a little bit, 
and that can precipitate a disorder that looks very similar to keratoconus. Wow. Now, these are patients that I have seen in my own clinic in the last couple of months, which I think are instructive, which I would like to use as teaching points here in the lecture. And as we move on, I think I hear somebody's microphone in the background with some shuffling and clicking. So if anyone has their microphone on, you may want to know that. He was referred by his local eye doctor and his subjective complaint was poor quality vision. He said he had glare, he said he had halos. With his glasses, he was reading the 2020 line. But his optometrist thought that these complaints were significant enough, suspicious enough to refer him to a cornea specialist for an evaluation. And these were his corneal images that we obtained in our office. Now, for all of these educated audience members, these images are taken from a device called a pentacam. A pentacam performs what's called corneal tomography. And corneal tomography is different than corneal topography in that corneal tomography gives you more information. It tells you not only about the curvature of the front part of the cornea, but it tells you about the thickness of the cornea and the back part of the cornea. So one point of interest, you may be writing down or thinking to yourself, does my eye doctor use a corneal tomographer? Do they use a pentacam to evaluate my cornea or are they using a topographer? Topographer is good, there's nothing wrong with it, but the tomographer provides more information. And in this instance, what we're seeing is that both eyes, the right and the left eye, OD is dexter, OS is sinister, that's the left eye, the right and the left eye show inferior steepening of the cornea. That's that hot spot, that yellow bulge you see at the bottom of the cornea. This is what keratoconus looks like in a person that's imaged with corneal tomography. It looks like a mosquito bite bulge hernia of astigmatism at the bottom of the cornea. So the diagnosis here of keratoconus and the major concern in this young person who's just been diagnosed is that this could get worse. You know, presently the vision is 2020 with glasses without even a contact lens, but keratoconus, remember, is defined as a progressive disease and it could most certainly progress. So what's the treatment? Well, the gold standard in this instance is corneal cross-linking. Now, corneal cross-linking has been around since 2003. It was originally dubbed the Dresden Protocol because it was described initially in Dresden, Germany. And the operation involves dripping a riboflavin solution over the surface of the cornea for 30 minutes, and then 30 more minutes while the patient looks at a UV laser. So this hour-long treatment results in stiffening the cornea. Now this process is mechanical. You can see this picture here, the yellow sliver is a cross-linked slice of pig cornea, and the white sliver is an uncross-linked slice of pig cornea. So you can see from this image that the cross-linking effect, it doesn't depend on patient healing, it doesn't depend on how the body responds, it's something that you can see in a laboratory on a piece of inert tissue. So it affects a mechanical stiffening and strengthening of the cornea that protects against worsening of shape. The reason to do cross-linking is not to improve the vision. It's not to improve the shape of the cornea. It's not to turn back the clock on what has happened. The purpose of cross-linking is to stop the progression of disease. And what I tell my patients is I say, it's sort of analogous to imagine your house is on fire. When do you call the fire department? Do you call the fire department after half the house is burned down, after one, one room of the house is burned down? How much of the house do you allow to burn down? The answer is you want to call the fire department 
immediately to stop the progression of the fire as soon as you detect it. And keep in mind, the fire department, they put the fire out, but they don't rebuild your house. They don't buy you new furniture. Whatever is burned up is gone. So cross-linking is the fire department. They will put the fire out, but this does not repair the damage that has occurred. Now, remember I told you in a previous slide that keratoconus is defined as a disease that gets worse. This is a fascinating study that I want to tell you about that took place in Italy. Turns out a few years ago in Italy, this study was accidentally performed. There were patients who were scheduled in Italy for cross-linking because they had been diagnosed by their eye doctor with progressive keratoconus. But then something happened. Before they could get cross-linked, COVID hit. And as you know, Italy was extremely badly afflicted and everything shut down for three months. After three months, the hospitals started to open up again for non-pneumonia related medical problems. And these keratoconic patients who would have been cross-linked but weren't came back in for another evaluation. And after a three month delay in their treatment, what these eye doctors figured out is that 70% of the patients had gotten worse, had developed a permanent worsening of the shape of their cornea. And the consequence of that worsening was one line of vision on the eye chart. So people ask me all the time, my patients who come to me, you know, the average keratoconic patient is young, they're in college maybe, or just in grad school, just out, you know, in their 30s. And what they want to know is, okay, well, it's February and I've been diagnosed. Can I wait till the summer to get cross-linked? And the answer is unequivocally no. There is really good evidence that a delay in treatment, even just by a couple of months, risks permanent degradation in the optical quality of the cornea. So progressive keratoconus is not an emergency, but it is an urgency. It's something that deserves to be addressed as soon as practically possible. Now, there are a lot of keratoconic patients that you know, will talk to me and they'll say, well, I was diagnosed when I was 18 and I'm 57 now and I don't think I'm getting any worse. So you keep saying, Jack, that keratoconus gets worse and worse and worse, but I don't think I'm getting worse. How do I know for sure? How can I tell for sure if I'm getting worse? Well, let me ask you a question. Before I, before I answer that, let me pose a different question. These are four different eyes from four different patients. And these are their corneal tomographies. These are the best, most sensitive images that we have on these patients. So for these four eyes, I want to ask, what is the vision of these four patients? So the first image, the patient all the way on the left, what's the vision of that eye? It's obviously got a corneal hernia. Clearly the cornea is steeper and thinner than it should be. What's the vision? And the answer is this person is 20-20, uncorrected with no glasses. And how about the second eye? Well, it's also 20-20. And how about the third eye? It's 20-20. And how about the fourth eye? This eye is 20-20. And you know, these images, these curvatures are drastically altered. You know, you don't have to be an eye doctor to look at this and say, well, these are, these are unusually shaped. You know, this should be a singular green color. These should be four green circles that you're seeing, not corneas with these red bulges at the bottom. So the point is, is that you can have corneal warpage. You can be losing shape to your cornea. You can have drastic change before you observe a change in your vision. You can be getting worse and worse and worse and not know about it if you're not getting imaged. And what I tell my patients in this regard is that when you're going down, it's kind of like if you've jumped off a building, okay? So you jump off a building, you're fine all the way down. It's only at the last second that you have a problem. And here with these eyes, you can see that you're going down in these images and you don't want to. You want the shape of the cornea stabilized before you hit bottom and now you've lost vision. So the best way to know for a fact if you're getting worse is to have your cornea imaged by corneal topography or tomography. Now, it's also important to pay attention to your changing refraction. I've got a really good friend who's a brilliant cornea specialist, and what he tells his patients is if you are seeing a change in your astigmatism, 
particularly a big change. That's not normal. Your prescription shouldn't be changing big time as an adult. Kind of like your shoe prescription, your shoe size doesn't change big time when you're an adult. Your glove size doesn't change when you're an adult. You know, I mean, the thing that changes is your waistline, you know, your pant size change because the shape of your body is changing. And here, if you're having a big change in your prescription, it means the shape of your eye is changing. So that's something to pay attention to. Now, it is a misconception to think that you only need to be cross-linked if you've lost vision. It's a misconception to think that as long as you're doing well with your glasses or you're doing well with your scleral contact lens, then you don't need cross-linking. You need cross-linking if you've got a progressive disease that's getting worse. If you've got a problem, you got to stamp it out before it burns down the whole house. Now, people ask me all the time, should we do epithelium on cross-linking or epithelium off cross-linking? Well, there's a very simple answer to this question. The only treatment in the United States that is FDA approved is epithelium off. And the reason that epithelium off is the one that's FDA approved is it's better studied and the efficacy data are better proven. So epithelium off, I think, is the modality that has the best evidence in its support. And it's also the only modality that's covered by insurances. So epithelium on is probably less effective. It's definitely less well studied. And it's also not covered by anyone's insurance. So if you have an epithelium on treatment, you're gonna be paying out of pocket probably thousands of dollars for a treatment that is not as well researched and confirmed as epithelium off. Now, I think that what you can expect as a patient who's being cross-linked is the first month or two after the treatment, you're gonna say, I'm worse, my vision is worse, my eye is more uncomfortable. That's normal. What I tell my patients who are cross-linked is I say, you know, we've done architectural remodeling to your cornea. We've changed the fibers that make up the shape of your cornea. And if you've ever done any remodeling, for example, on your house, a week into the job, you go into the kitchen, and if it looks just like the kitchen looked like the week before, you say, well, what are you bums doing? You know, you want to see ripped up floorboards and dangling wires and exposed pipes. I mean, you want to see men at work. And the first month or two after cross-linking is the men at work stage of corneal remodeling. So this image, this graph, what it shows is that for the first month after cross-linking, the cornea actually gets steeper as the cornea heals. But after three months and six months and one year, not only is the cornea no longer steepening, not only is the progression not seen, but usually the cornea is a little flatter. Now, likewise with the vision, what I tell my patients who come see me is that cross-linking won't improve your vision. And, you know, I think the reason I do that is because it's nice to not build up expectations but actually, usually the vision does get a little bit better with cross-linking. Usually patients after about a year are seeing about a line better on the eye chart. But for the first month, they're not. They're seeing worse in the first month than they were before the treatment. And that is normal. Likewise, when your eye doctor looks at you with their slit lamp, with their microscope in clinic, the cornea looks hazy for the first month or so after treatment. That's the way it should look. That means something has been done and the eye is responding to the treatment. If you don't see this haze, that's actually when you worry. Now, putting cross-linking aside, I want to talk to you about something that's very interesting to me. This is another patient that we saw who was presenting to us with progressive keratoconus he had already lost vision. He was 20, 30 with his glasses. And he was worried about getting worse. So obviously we're gonna cross link this person. But you know, what he's also worried about is that he doesn't see as well as he'd like to. He's only 20, 30 with his glasses. And you can see from this image, he's got a big bulge down at the bottom of the cornea, that orange, yellow, red hot spot. That's where the cornea is misshapen. So what he wants to know when he sees me is what can be done to improve my vision. 
Now, one thing I'm not a fan of, and I say this as a cornea specialist who does a lot of corneal transplants, for keratoconus, I think transplantation is best avoided if at all possible because it's a big, aggressive, invasive operation which imposes a lifetime of responsibility. It's like getting a puppy, you know, it could be great, but if that puppy is gonna live 80 years, you know, if the transplant's gonna be with you for your whole life, you better be darn sure you want it before you get it. So I like to not do transplants if we can help it. So what can be done to improve the vision in this eye? Well, you know, an old treatment is this operation intact. Now intacts, are pieces of lucite. These are pieces of bulletproof glass that can be put in the cornea to create a more normal shape. Intacts have been around for a long time. They've got a really good track record of success. They improve the vision by about two lines on the eye chart, and they're covered by almost everybody's insurance. So that's a lot of positives, but there are some disadvantages to intacts. The first is, is that not everybody is eligible for intact. You can only have moderate keratoconus if your cornea is too steep or too thin. You can't put these segments in people. Otherwise, they'll work their way to the surface of the eye and then come out. It's kind of like you heard these stories about grandpa, he was a moonshiner and he got shot in the butt 50 years ago and now the bullet has worked its way to the surface. These segments can come out if you rub your eyes especially. That's the first thing is that you have to worry long time about these segments extruding if you're not careful. And the other, the other problem with them is that you can get glare or halos off of these refractive, reflective segments. Now it's not all the time, but if you have light shown in the eye obliquely, it glistens off these segments. So when people are, for instance, driving at night, they get their dashboard glare come up. When they're watching a movie in a dark room and their pupil is dilated, they can see the ed edge of these segments. So these disadvantages, not appropriate for everybody, can over the long term cause some problems, and in the short term can cause glare and other visual artifacts inspired a search for an alternative treatment. And this alternative treatment developed by Dr. Susan Jacobs in India is what I call Intax version 2.0. It's the upgraded model. It's CARES, which stands for corneal allogenic intrastromal ring segments. CARES are exactly the same as Intax, exactly the same, exactly, except one thing. The segments are not made out of bulletproof glass. They're not made out of plastic. They're made out of collagen. More specifically, they're made out of donor human cornea. And you might say, well, why would you want to use human cornea instead of plastic? Well, there are a few reasons. The first thing is that human collagen is as biocompatible as it gets. So when you put these segments in an eye, there is no tendency for them to extrude. There's no tendency for the body to want to spit them out or reject them, like with a plastic segment. As a result, over the long term, you're much more confident about the safety of these segments. In addition, because the body doesn't want to spit them out, you can place them up higher in the recipient cornea, in the patient's eye. And when you put them closer to the surface of the cornea, you can get much more flattening of the cornea. So the effect that you get when you put care segments in the eye is much more dramatic than the effect you get with intact segments. You get much more reshaping of the cornea and much better visual improvement. And the other thing is because this material is made out of the same thing as your cornea, there's no glistening, there's no glare from the segments. So those immediate dysphotopsias, those problems with subjective quality of vision are addressed. This is a video that shows uh, CARES implantation in an eye with keratoconus. And um, the operation involves first marking the surface of the eye. That's what I'm doing here. And I'm using a little centering crosshair and then an ink tipped instrument 
just to place a dot right on the center of the cornea. This is another guide that tells me where I will put these CARES segments in the eye. Now, this patient is being operated on in our office, by the way. This is a minor procedure, which takes about five minutes. You don't have to go to sleep. You don't have to um, be fasting, you can have breakfast and have the procedure. It takes five minutes and you go home that day. A little incision is placed at the edge of the cornea and a space is dissected on either part of the incision using this blunt little rod. This is a dissection spatula that we use to spread a channel in the recipient cornea to accommodate these pieces of cornea. So we don't use a laser, we don't use any knives that cut the cornea. This is just a very gentle spreading of a space in the middle of the patient's cornea. And once that channel is created, I'll make a second incision in the nasal part, that's the part next to the nose of the cornea, and that allows me to feed these care segments to myself. And I think you'll see what I mean. I'm just confirming here that that second incision intersects the channels that I've created. Now these care segments, because they disappear, they're the same color as your cornea, as the patient cornea, I stain them blue, just so I can see them during the operation. So that blue stain was gone by the next day, but it hangs around for about an hour, and that's more than enough time for me to be able to place these segments in the eye. So what I'm doing here is I'm just very delicately, gradually pushing them along this channel here into the eye. And you can see that little inset box, that's what the segments look like if you don't stain them. So it's much, much actually uh, easier surgery if you stain them, you can see what you're doing. And the other thing that we have sort of figured out is that if you thin the segments out by letting them dry a bit before you implant them, you can use thicker segments and get greater flattening. So these are two little innovations to the technique which Susan originally described that we've made. And I think it helps give us really, really good results. So we feed the segment in basically as far as it will go. And then we come around through that second incision and pull it to its final location. That's what we're doing here. Yeah. And so there's the first segment which is in. And many people just need one segment, just need one collagen segment placed. This is an eye with very advanced keratoconus, extremely severe. And so we need two segments for this particular case. But even so, this is a five minute operation, which is done under just topical anesthesia, just some numbing medicine around the eye, no shots, um, no blood, obviously. So this is a very, very well tolerated procedure even for our young, very jittery patients. You can see, by the way, that the incisions that we made, they're sort of gaped open, they're splayed a bit because the shape of the cornea is so much flatter after we put these segments in. So we're just gonna put a stitch here in both of the incisions. The stitch is removed in the office after a couple of weeks. And uh, that's the whole operation. So, You've now all seen a complete CARES case. The blue, seg blue coloration is gone by the next day. This is the patient who had CARES. So you can see the preoperative tomography that's on the far left. The middle image is the postoperative tomography. And the right image is the difference between the first two. And what the right image is showing is the cornea here has been flattened by 13 diopters. And you might say, well, what's a diopter? Is that a lot? Is that good? Well, the normal cornea is 43 diopters steep, okay? So like my cornea is 43 diopters steep. Somebody with advanced keratoconus is usually steeper than 57. That's the cutoff. Steeper than 57, we say you've got advanced disease. So this person, had a maximum curvature of 64. So this was a very advanced cone. And what you notice 
is that the day after surgery, their maximum curvature went from 64 to 51. So a drastic difference in the shape of the cornea. And we have many such examples. So here's another eye. The middle image this time is our preoperative image. The leftmost image is our postoperative image. And the rightmost image is the difference. And if you can imagine that orange red as a glowing fire, you can see the far right image, that blue, that's the amount of water that was thrown on the fire. So quite a lot. There's quite a lot of dousing of this problem. Here's another case. This was an eye with extremely advanced keratoconus. The maximum curvature was in the 90s and one day postoperatively, they had more than 20 diopters of flattening. And practically speaking, what that means is this is a person that would have had a full thickness corneal transplant who now doesn't have to have one. Now they can wear a scleral lens or a regular contact lens, a hard lens. This is somebody who's able to avoid a transplant because they had a reshaping of their cornea from these collagen inserts. So I think that what's important to relay here is that CARES is the very best technology we have available to us now for improving the shape of the cornea in somebody who's already lost shape from keratoconus. Now, this is another case that I want to share, and it's the last case and the last teaching point. This is somebody with early keratoconus. They're extremely nearsighted, very myopic. Their prescription is a minus nine in both eyes with astigmatism. And they're coming to me because they want LASIK. Now, obviously, everybody listening knows that if you have keratoconus, you can't have LASIK. But is there anything that can be done for these people who have very strong prescriptions with a lot of astigmatism, who want LASIK, who want to be able to see better, who want to be less dependent on their Coke bottle glasses or their contact lens, can anything be done? Well, actually, there is. There is a technology that has been around for a long time that has recently undergone drastic improvements. And this technology is what's called an implantable contact lens or an implantable collimer lens. And this is a lens that's meant to be put inside the eye in a minor procedure in the office and it can treat even very severe amounts of nearsightedness and nearsighted astigmatism, including in people whose nearsighted astigmatism comes from keratoconus. Now, you don't have to have keratoconus to have one of these implantable contact lenses. Some people just prefer them over LASIK, like, for example, professional sports players, athletes, like, for example, Aaron Rodgers has these put in his eyes, even though he doesn't have keratoconus, because you know if he gets hit in the eye, it could mess up his LASIK flap, so we can't have that. So he has these contact lenses put in. Uh, the tennis player, Djokovic, he's got these lenses put in both of his eyes. Uh, one of the Jonas brothers actually just had these lenses put in both of his eyes. But really where these lenses shine is for people with severe astigmatism and severe myopia who can't have LASIK. Now these lenses fit behind the iris, the colored part of the eye, and they never have to be exchanged, they never have to be polished, they never have to change the prescription. What's really important about these lenses is that we use the right size lens. That's the risk. If you put a lens in the eye that's the wrong size, then sometimes the lens does have to be swapped out. We don't want that. So the way that we size the lens is we use this special instrument here on the right of the screen. It's called an arc scan. There are 22 of these in the country, 17 of which are on military bases because the military actually implants a lot of implantable contact lenses because their cadets can't have LASIK. If they get hit in the eye, something happens to the LASIK flap. So they do a lot of ICLs. We're one of the very few places in the world that have access to this technology. It's a major blessing to us because it lets us 
size the lens with an accuracy and a precision that's available almost nowhere else on the planet. This technology was invented in London at the London Vision Clinic by Dr. Dan Reinstein, who is an absolute pioneer in this area in treating myopic astigmatism with refractive surgery. And this has, has allowed us to treat our keratoconic patients with something that can drastically improve their vision without consigning them to a lifetime of glasses and contact lenses. The lens, as you can tell, is basically invisible, even with a high-powered microscope. So it's not something that anybody else can, can tell that you've had. Compared to LASIK, by the way, it tends to give you better results, even if you can have LASIK. And the reason is, is that, you know, when you have any kind of laser procedure to the eye, the eye tries to undo the damage that was done. You know, there's a healing response. Naturally, the eye tries to restore the balance that you're in before. Whereas with a contact lens, you know, you wear your contact to your glasses, the body doesn't try to undo the contact or glasses. It more or less accepts that. So with the implantable contact lens, you tend to get much better quality vision. And that quality vision is maintained over a long period of time, unlike, for example, LASIK, which can wear off over time. So I think that one thing that we're really excited about with these new implantable columnar, implantable contact lenses is the ability to make drastic improvement in the vision of people that otherwise have been told, I'm sorry, just wear your thick glasses, you're not a LASIK candidate. It's the very best refractive and the safest refractive surgery we have. So in conclusion, what I would say is that cross-linking is a total no-brainer. If you've just recently been diagnosed with keratoconus, it puts the fire out, it stops the progression of disease. If you want to treat the abnormal shape of the cornea, hairs is the best we've got. And if you've got a good quality vision, but a very high prescription, you may be a candidate for what's called an implantable columnar or contact lens. Try to liberate you a bit from these strong prescriptions. So these are all my prepared remarks. And of course, now I'd like to thank you all for your attention and open up the floor, of course, also to Gloria for any questions. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive and detailed and really enlightening lecture, Dr. Parker. Um, we have several questions, but before we get to them, I have a question myself in regards to the um, implant implantable columnar lens. How, let me rephrase this. In regards to keratoconus patients who have some degree of irregular astigmatism, if they don't see well with glasses or a soft contact, are they candidates for the ICL? They are certainly less good candidates. The implantable columnar lens provides you the same or slightly better quality vision that you'd get with a soft toric contact lens. Got it. But nothing provides you as good a vision as a scleral lens. A scleral lens is as good as it gets. So the best candidates for an ICL are people who've got good vision in their glasses or good vision in a soft contact lens with some astigmatism correction, but they just hate being dependent on those things. Now, there are many people who have a measure of irregular astigmatism. For example, they see 2400 with nothing, with no prescription. And with a soft toric, the best you can get them is 2050, 2040. And you think, well, gosh, that's not 2020. Well, in these people, it's controversial. I think in these people, you have a discussion and you say, well, with your scleral lens, you can be 2020. With the implantable contact lens, you're 2040. Which do you prefer? And there are many people who say, well, I would prefer to have the very best possible vision. I want to be 2020 with the scleral. And there are other people who say, well, 
you know, I actually don't mind being 2040 if I don't have to wear the scleral lens. So in people that don't correct to 2020 because of the irregular stigmatism, it's a conversation, whereas it's slam dunk for people who do correct to 2020 with glasses or a soft toric. That's great. Awesome. Okay, so a couple more questions from our audience now. Do you have any statistics on success of corneal transplants on Down syndrome patients? And any tips about the recovery that patients should be aware of? So what's your experience in surgery for our Down syndrome patients? Um, my personal bias is that if you are a PhD rocket scientist working on the Manhattan Project, you should not have a full thickness corneal transplant for keratoconus probably. And the reason is, is that even if you are as scrupulous and diligent as you can possibly be and fastidious about taking care of your eyes and going to the doctor and using your drops, there are just so many problems that can occur. You know, it's a surgery that has unfortunately, a high risk of problems, not just in the short term, but over the very long term. And really what I try to do is discourage almost all of my patients from having a corneal transplant. And that would apply to me. You know, I, I would not want a full thickness corneal transplant in either of my eyes if I could help it. People who have Down syndrome, I think are even less able typically to participate in their own care. It's more difficult to take care of them. The data are certainly less good. So I would think that it really probably is a best avoided operation for somebody with Down syndrome, if, if at all possible. Um, what is typically a better option for somebody with Down syndrome rather than replacing the cornea is to reshape the cornea to make it more optically functional with something like a CARES transplant, a CARES procedure. Got it, thank you. So this is an interesting question. Can you still have cataract surgery if you have keratoconus? And on top of that, are there any special precautions uh, that the patient or the surgeon needs to take for keratoconus patients who need cataract surgery? Absolutely. So you most certainly can have cataract surgery. Everybody eventually grows up and needs cataract surgery. So all keratoconics eventually, if they live long enough, will live to the point where their lens wears out and needs to be replaced. When we do cataract surgery, we have lenses that we put inside the eye always. Whenever you have cataracts, we take your lens out and we always put a new lens inside the eye. That new lens has a prescription. The new lens can correct a measure of astigmatism. It may be worthwhile to have a lens put inside your eye that corrects some of your astigmatism. The key concern though, is if you have an astigmatism correcting lens put inside your eye with cataract surgery, you will no longer be able to wear a hard or a scleral lens after the surgery. You won't. The lens does not play well with an astigmatism correcting lens inside the eye. So if you are dependent on your hard or scleral lens, and you're considering having cataract surgery, that's fine, I'm not telling you not to have surgery, but you should know that it may be in your best interest to not have an astigmatism correcting lens put in your eye, to have a regular lens put in your eye, and then to continue to wear your hard or scleral contact lens. That may give you the very best vision. And I have to say, as a scleral lens provider and optometrist, I do agree with you that for patients who are dependent and enjoy wearing their either RGP or scleral contact lens and are okay wearing it after cataract surgery, they should avoid the whole toric you know, implant or the one that corrects for astigmatism because what happens is 
maybe they see better uncorrected now, which is great. It's closer and gets them able to see like who's across from them, the room. But there's this degree of residual shadows and glare that if you send them back to your optometrist for the scleral lens fitting, it's very difficult to fine tune because now you're having to correct the irregular keratoconus cornea as well as potentially some induced astigmatism from the implant. So I agree with you that for patients with really high levels of, you know, moderate to advanced keratoconus and astigmatism, you know, correct as much of the power as possible in a um, a monofocal, well, maybe the terminology is too much here, but just without the astigmatism and yeah. correct the residual with the contact. So I think that's something very important to, to know. I think that's very well said. And you know, since you mentioned the topic of monofocal, if people are really considering cataract surgery now, I would you know just write this down. You can do your research on it later. There are basically three types of lenses. There's what's called a monofocal lens, which I think both Gloria and I agree with. That's what we'd recommend for a keratoconic. A toric lens, which corrects some degree of astigmatism, and that's kind of iffy, maybe, yeah, sometimes in the right patient. And there's what's called a multifocal lens, which is a, in my opinion, total no-go. That's something you should not have. A multifocal lens splits light to try to give you some independence from reading glasses after your cataract surgery. You know, most people have cataract surgery, now they're wearing reading glasses. If you've got keratoconus, you're not a candidate for that lens, stay away from it. Agreed, same with severe dry eye. It causes yeah. all kinds of issues with determining the right prescription. All right, so another question, can you have intacts implanted instead of cross-linking to stop keratoconus progression? Maybe, it's debatable. There are some good data that say yes, there are some good data that say no. Um, intacts may stiffen the cornea. They probably do stiffen the cornea. I don't know if they stiffen the whole cornea or just where they lie. One benefit of intacts, you know, keratoconus is very much um, uh, encouraged to progress by eye rubbing. And that's something I wish I had talked about a little bit more. I'm sorry that I omitted it, but eye rubbing is a big contributor to progression of keratoconus. And intacts, when you have them put in your eye, if you rub your eye, it hurts. So that's great. That's a good thing. That's a benefit that people are reminded not to rub their eyes because the intacts hurt. Uh, in my patients who are progressing, what I tell them is you need to be cross-linked. And if you want to have intacts or cares to improve your vision, we can do that. Now you might say, well, couldn't you just do intacts or cares and see if that fixes the problem? You could, you could. But going back to our analogy of the house is on fire and I say, well, we need to call the fire department. And you say, well, couldn't we see if you and I could put it out with a garden hose Yes, we could, and maybe that will work. But you know what we're talking about here is taking a risk with your vision, with the quality of your vision for the rest of your life. Cross-linking takes an hour. It's not any big deal. It's not a surgery. We do it in our office. It's an eye drop while you look at a light. It's not exciting. It's boring. I think the idea of you want to try to see what you can get away with and maybe not have that done, if it were my eye, I wouldn't be rolling those dice. Thanks for that input. And do you typically recommend intacts first or cross-linking first? We've done it both ways. What I usually do in my own personal practice is I usually do intacts or cares first and then cross-linking second. And the reason I do that is not because I think it works better that way. It may, but the reason I do it that way is when you do cross-linking on a patient, they come back and they're mad. They don't like you because their eye hurts and it's watery and the vision is blurrier than it was before the surgery. And that's for a month, okay? And then a few months later, you show them their corneal tomography and you say, ta-da, Miss Jones, look, you had progressive disease before and now you don't. In fact, the shape of your cornea is a little bit better. 
and Ms. Jones says, okay, I guess I'll take your word for it, okay? But it's not a, uh, everybody's popping champagne bottles and jumping up and down, excited, moved to tears by how great things are. It's just, you have the knowledge that you're safer. Whereas with Intax or CARES, after that procedure, one day after the surgery, you say, this is great, I can see. So I like to do Intax or CARES first because it builds patient trust with me. And then after the patient says, okay, we're getting somewhere, I see better, yes, this is working. Then we do the thing that statistically makes them safer. If we do the thing that statistically makes them safer first, then they say, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm not really sure we're barking up the right tree. So I, I think psychologically, I prefer to do the Intax first. Interesting, okay. Uh, another question, where can you get the CARES surgery? Are all surgeons offering this advanced surgical procedure? Um, there is a guy in Michigan who I think is doing it. He flew down to watch us do the procedure. Um, I'm forgetting his name, but I think if you probably Google it, you may be able to find it. Um, but he's an ophthalmologist in Michigan, a corneal specialist. Uh, we are doing it in Birmingham, Alabama. There may be other people in the United States. I'm not sure for a fact. Okay. Um, so if, you, if you're interested, I would, I would Google it. I would research it and see if there are any providers in your area. Got it. Another attendee asked, my son is 19 years old and was recently diagnosed with keratoconus. His doctor has recommended cross-linking. Should we wait for progression before we get cross-linking? Well, I think that, um, you know, what what is progression? So progression is kind of a medically word, okay? So what is progression? Well, what progression is, is we have objective evidence of permanent deterioration of the shape of the cornea, okay? Um, and if it were me or if it were my son and I was told, well, look, you've been diagnosed with a disease which is defined as a disease that gets worse over time and he didn't used to have it and now he does, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna wait for him to get a little bit worse and then treat him or would you like to treat him now? For me, I would wanna be treated basically as soon as possible. Now, cross-linking is not, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing in life that doesn't have risk. Everything has got risk. You know, I mean, when you, when you, um, you know, get in your car, go to work in the morning, you could be killed. You know, I mean, bad things can and do happen to good people all the time. So this is a real medical treatment. It's a real medical procedure. It does something. It changes the eye. But if it were me, what I would not want is I would not want for the doctor to observe that I had permanently gotten worse before treating me for with a diagnosis that we all knew that I had. Good answer. And I think sometimes for insurance coverage, they often may require some note of progression before they will cover the cross-linking. So maybe that's what this parent was asking. Yeah, but I think if, you're, if your child was normal and had good vision with glasses before, and then it changed, that's enough to document progression. You don't have to watch the steepening get worse or the thinning increase. If you've found a change in vision, you know, and this is something your doctor should know already, or mild steepening from what you had before, that's enough documentation. You don't have to confirm it at the new doctor when you can also review old notes. So that's that, right. That's important to note too. So this, this concept of documentation of progression, here's, here's what it, it aims at. So there are people who are 70 years old who are diagnosed with keratoconus when they were 18 and they haven't budged at all in 20 years or 40 years, okay? And the insurance company doesn't want the doctors just cross-linking everybody because not everybody needs to be treated, okay? So that requirement is meant to prevent indiscriminately meeting out treatment right. to old people who have been stable for 20, 30, 40 years, okay? That requirement is not meant to apply to a young person who's just recently diagnosed who definitely wasn't this way five years ago, okay? So if you're worried, well, do we have the documentation necessary to prove it to the insurance company's satisfaction? That is always can be achieved. It's just a matter of shuffling paperwork 
you can get it done. It's not that big of a deal. For sure, it, it, it's possible in any young person who's just been recently diagnosed, they should be cross-linked. Right, and I think you, you hit the nail there that it's really our younger patients that we're more concerned about progression because it's typically in the teens and 20s that we see the onset and progression of this disease. So we're out of time, but I just wanted to make one more comment in terms of hard contacts, RGP scleral lenses, I wanted to get the point across to our audience that contacts themselves do not affect progression. It doesn't help keratoconus. It doesn't, you know, um, stop or halt progression like crosslinking does. It simply corrects your vision. So there's the disease and the vision aspect of keratoconus, and I wanted to get that point across. Yeah, and I agree. With that if you could move, oh, you are on our last slide here. So I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Parker, for your time and your expertise for this past hour, as well as everybody who's joined us live and those who will be watching this um, recording later on. Our next evening webinar will be on January 10th, 2023 in the new year. The topic is Keratoconus in Children by Dr. Katherine Hatch. So we hope that you'll tune in with us in two months. And I wish everybody a wonderful evening. Stay safe. Happy holidays. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy holidays. Happy New Year before we see you back. And thank you again, Dr. Parker, for joining us this evening. Have a good one. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much, Glory, for putting it all together. Thank you.